Okay, hopefully you can hear me pretty well on the uh, microphone. So, uh, many of you know me, I'm Peter Turner. I uh, came to Commodore in 89, stayed till 93, and worked on a whole bunch of stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about my experience, and in a way, the software part of my era hasn't really been that well told. Uh, Dave Heaney and others have covered the hardware part, and you know, RJ and others have covered sort of the software part before my time. So, kind of put together a little bit of a, some visuals based on stuff that I found. So, for many of us in the room, this is where it began. I wasn't there at the inception, but we got the Byte magazine, and, and we just were blown away by what we read, and we couldn't believe it, we had to get one, so we pulled, scraped our money together, and bought our Amigas. I did a lot of stuff with it, I did a lot of uh, noodling and drawing, I'm not an artist, so I used techniques like uh, pausing a VCR and tracing it, and then to trace it over the <laughs> screen and painting underneath it, and drawing things I was familiar with. Like, was grew up in Montreal, Canada, hence the Canadian money and the waterfall outside Quebec City. Um, and one of the projects I worked on was I built this all singing, all dancing file dialog box, and the Amiga back in point three days didn't have one, and I drove through a wicked snowstorm to the world of Commodore in Toronto with Patrick Bullier, who's one of the, he's right there, hey Patrick, <laughs> my co-pilot on this whole adventure. We drove through the worst December weather you can imagine, got to the world of Commodore, and uh, I actually visited a friend at Nortel, at Northern Telecom, and I had the software on my floppy, and on the way out of the Nortel building, the security guard stopped us and said, we need to check your bags. And he says, you can't take floppies out of the building. I'm like, this is my work, I need to show. So it took about 15 minutes of arguing, brought it to World Commodore, showed it to Gail Wallings and the panel at Scheffner, and they said, the bad news is we've signed someone to deliver us a file out of our box. The good news is we want your resume because we want you to come work for us. And so without much ado, I ended up with an offer letter, a business card, and I moved from Montreal to the Philadelphia area to work for Commodore. And some of them, there's me. <laughs> So some of the people I worked for were Andy Finkel, who is here, and uh, Eric Cotton, who was working on preferences at the time, and Bryce Nesbitt, who unfortunately is in Germany this week and couldn't be here, and he was one of the people I was really hoping to, to reconnect with. And so uh, the VP of Engineering at the time was Henry Rubin, and Henry was quite a character and, and you know, mixed bag of tales there. But the short, short version of the experience was we were working on 1.4, driving towards a beta release, and I guess things weren't going as fast as they wanted, and so management put out a bonus, I don't remember how much it was, $800,000 or something, if we got it done by the beginning of December. And we were working so hard, everybody was focused, and Henry said, I want to call a meeting to give a pep talk, and Andy pretty much did everything in his power to prevent that meeting from happening. Couldn't stop the meeting from happening, gathered us all in the room, and Henry gave us this pep talk. And as he was talking, you could just feel the air leave the room. We were already full on making this thing happen. We didn't need to be told by someone else. And that's where he, he literally said, We need an effort like we've never seen before. From which I think it was Bryce that turned that into, We need an effort like we've never seen before again. So. <laughs> Thing. And the other complication that happened during that time was there was one day we came in, and that's Steve Beats, who uh, came from the UK. Uh, I think he worked at the Commodore Warehouse, and he was showing Gail Wellington some of the things he was noodling on on the big 20 or 64. So Gail pulled him into software development over time. And Dave Berezowski, who was the person that was managing the WordPress application at the time, and they came in one morning, and these two guys looked bedraggled, tired, but smug as all get out. They wouldn't say why, and uh, I said why, and they said not going to show you until more people are here. So gradually, 10, 11 o'clock, enough people trickled in. And what they had done is they had taken uh, Workbench and Intuition, which looked roughly like this, and they hacked it overnight into something that looked like this. So we were all moved by the next computer and where that design was going. And this is actually not the exact vintage. I don't think there are any screenshots I've ever seen of that exact vintage, but that was Steve and Dave's overnight hack, and that truly was the, the beginning of a new look that was ultimately 2.0. And so 
there was a lot of mock-ups that we did. The AA3000 that's out there still works miraculously. Um, I booted it up and I went spelunking on it and I found a lot of files that I probably shouldn't have kept. Um, <laughs> but among them were artistic renditions and actual running renditions of different designs. So I thought I'd try a few of them out here. This one I believe was drawn by Ross Hipley who did a lot of our manuals work and a bunch of our uh, art and UI art. So it's kind of a concept piece. A little bit more radical than what we ended up with. This is another one of his designs, so we see some treatment of the pull-down menus and a little bit of uh, stylizing of the font and typeface and icons. Another one that he did, um, trying to you know, make the icons look a little bit more unusual or eye-catching with some diagonals and again other changes in the treatment of the scroll bars and, and uh, highlighting and so on. So a couple of kind of vision pieces that we had kicked around. Um, and then this one is one I think I did, and, and I'm not sure what I was thinking with the stripes, but uh, they're vertical so they don't flicker in interlace mode. Uh, but we see drop shadow starting to take place, standardized uh, buttons starting to take place. And then um, this is an interesting sequence I have going here. So this is actually running uh, early alpha 1.4 something or other windows, and I don't know who drew the highly scrapey buttons, but I think some of the, maybe, I don't know if you drop an A3000 into its built-in ROM, and this is what you get. But they're not that attractive, and we weren't super obsessed with how they looked like at the beginning, but we started to noodle with them, and so uh, I drew this one where we broke the regions out, kind of like chocolate bar uh, score mark style. It's still the same glyphs as the previous one, but they're broken out into uh, individual pieces. We later made the window borders contiguous, so we're trying to make this window have a little bit more window continuity. Uh, and then we actually came close to the final uh, gadgets, and you can see the closed gadget. In the upper left corner was an X, because we thought X was conventional, but it looked a lot crinklier than the box. And so in there we kind of, I don't know, we were thinking of the dot that used to remain on your TV when you turned it off back in the old days. But we settled on the dot and the simplified triangle for resizing in the corner. And actually, um, there's a couple more intermediate stages that we noodle with, but these were all drawn, all done in deep paint, and some of them were put into the code to get to the look that we ended up with. Uh, and then I found a whole bunch more diagrams that I had drawn, but all the writing that you see, those are my notes from 1990, 1991. These were all actually, I'm running this in Scala, which is now a Windows application. So it's Scala running on Windows on the MacBook. Um, and this is an ILBM file, so I didn't convert it. Um, it's, we still support it for some reason. Uh, but these are some different uh, design notes I had made at the time. So the UI concept we were noodling with was if it was raised, it was clickable. If it was something, it was informational, read-only. Uh, we had some ideas for checkboxes. And you know, I was looking at people's cars or looking at you know, air conditioning buttons and stuff like that, trying to get inspiration for how we could do things that look good, were clearly recognizable, fit together as a family. Uh, so a lot of different ideas for toggle buttons. This one is kind of a dog's breakfast of designs. So it was trying to we're toying with the idea that a button that closed the dialog box or requester would have a distinctive look. And so we tried heavier borders, borders that were raised to bevel, bevel and raised, things that look like they come from iPhones uh, back in 1990 a little bit. So a lot of different buttons, oval buttons, which were what Open Look was doing. I don't know what I was thinking with the, the little sort of but I mean, that experimentation is where the good ideas come from, so it's brainstorming activity. Uh, and so here's some designs for string entry fields. So I like the recess field, it violated rule one on the other slide, but it looks really good. Um, we tried stuff with underlines, double underlines. I had the idea maybe that the, if it was numeric entry, we could put a little number sign in there, you know, hashtags they call them these days. And um, so we didn't go with any of those, but there's some different ideas that we had for concepts of the UI. Uh, playing a lot with radio buttons, mutual exclusives, trying to play with the idea that they collectively work as a group, and so somehow or other there should be some grouping to go with them, and so some different designs. There's a whole other slide I didn't show where it was like layers upon layers upon layers. It looked like some kind of Mayan pyramid that would never work. Uh, but different designs that we had for uh, ideas for radio buttons. And then here's some more heavily stacked stuff. So these were sliders and, and stuff. So one of the things about Intuition was it gave you the raw sliding box component, but it didn't tame it at all. So every application in those days had you know different 
quirks and misbehaviors on the sliders. You know, you couldn't get the last line of the text until you scrolled the very last pixel, or stuff wouldn't snap back if there were. So we built into the system standard one expression as a numeric slider. You could say go from one to ten, and one that was used for scrolling pages that had the right behaviors. And if you click to jump scroll, it would produce one line of overlap, so you get the continuity and all that. But behind that, we were also worrying about the visuals. So the behavior was one part of the visuals was another. So uh, we ended up with a simpler design than any of these, but these are different designs that we played with. And then this slide, so we, we knew we didn't have time to for a multi-choice button to implement kind of a pop-up menu. So we knew it was going to be kind of a click to cycle through them all. So we had a cycle button design. And then we had the, these sort of arrows chasing each other, which makes me think of the extra hands a little bit. And uh, after, 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 after. Um, and then the recirculating arrow there is the one that we sorry, ended up with uh, the laser here. So that's the one that we ended up with for 2.0. So those are things that really nobody has seen until I stumbled upon them again like two months ago. So that's really cool to have found. Um, so I don't know how I'm doing on time, so I'm going to do the long version of the story because it, I learned something yesterday. So Topaz was originally named Carla, and Carla is in the room here today. Carla. Bob, Bob Burns' his wife. And so the, the plan for 2.0 all along Hi, Carla. <laughs> was to replace Topaz with a font that had no serifs. So the belief was that at low resolutions, the serifs added more noise. It would look as if we got rid of them. And so there was a plan to get one, and we never, no one ever delivered that font. And uh, Kodiak, in an act of desperation, right before one of the betas, found some font with no serifs, he deliberately chose one that wasn't that good looking, and he stuffed it in the ROM, and the commit log said, in a last desperate grab for ROM space, here's the font. And so he basically provoked the, the font change. So we had this ugly uh, non-serif font for a couple of weeks in the ROM, and nobody could stand it, so several of us, I don't know if David Junot worked on it, I worked on it, or I'll worked on it. We basically took Topaz, and we shaved off the serifs, character by character, and came up with Topaz 2.0. It, it had a few problems. Some of the letters were unbalanced, so there were little tweakages we had to do to like M's and N's and other difficult letters. But the one that's interesting was the lowercase L, which, when you took the serifs off, was just a straight vertical bar. So it looked a lot like a vertical bar character. It looked a lot like a capital I. It wasn't super different from a square bracket. So I took the L and I curled it at the bottom. And I took a lot of heat for that because there is not a cursive font. It's not an italic font. What are you doing with this italic L? And I'm like, it's got to be done. We have to have distinction matters more than consistency. And it will work. And it, it actually it does, I think, survive the test of time from a stylistic point of view. And then the, the interesting part of the story is I'm driving down the highway in Pennsylvania, and I see a road sign. It's got not the standard roadside font. It's a slightly different type base. And the L is curved just like the Topaz 2.0. And it turns out that Pennsylvania has a project to develop a highly legible road sign font for those white and green signs that's going to ripple out and it's being used in multiple states now. And so that kind of was like my validation. And what I learned yesterday, so you remember it started with Carla and Kodiak. Kodiak's sister works for the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. <laughs> this is what I learned yesterday. Not in the typesetting typeface department, nor I don't believe in the prison where they probably are making their own <laughs> But anyway, all these things come full circle. Uh, DevCon. So this was obviously you know, a great time to gather. And today reminds me more of that than of anything else. And I was in San Francisco just a few weeks after I started. That was actually quite fun. So I was still staying in a hotel because I just relocated to Westchester. And then they said, you're going to go to DevCon San Francisco. And then, like three days before I left, the director of HR found this out, and they're like, well, you're going to have to move out of the Westchester Inn, because we're not going to pay for hotel rooms on both coasts. And um, then she called and found out that it, would be, it was too late to cancel and save any money. So um, I actually had company paid hotel rooms on both coasts as a, a young kid fresh out of school. So I felt pretty special. And I think, actually, Mike Sins went through exactly the same thing and just started at the same time. Um, but anyway, so this was... Uh, Atlanta Developers Conference, and so there's uh, a bunch of people. We got Kodiak right there, London Hunt, did a lot of networking work. Ken Fritz, Katz, Rob Weiss from Katz, Ken's wife, my wife, Stone Mountain. 
Darren Greenwald, John Orr, Jim Barkley, uh, Aimwell, Paul Raven, Bryce Nesbitt, lots of people on the development team take to celebrate probably the fifth birthday of the Liga, I'm guessing. Um, and then I believe that uh, Atlanta was where Jim officially handed off intuition responsibility to me. So there's Jim. <laughs> and uh, when we were on stage and he was kind of passing the baton, and I'll get to use this a second time, I told the audience then that I said, Jim, thank you very much. And now that I've seen the source code, I truly know that intuition is the only single word oxymoron. <laughs> I'm not sure he ever forgave me for that. And uh, R2 is probably going to be on that case for that after so. Uh, so this is um, Denver DEF CON. And in Denver, so my one true regret really in all the time is that I didn't get to be a lemming. And um, I ended up, I think I ended up with one of the costumes because I did find a Halloween picture from a couple years later of me wearing the green and the blue shirt. But the, they did a lot of horns and lemmings, and Bryce and Chris Green and Gail and others were, they came down the stairs and the music was playing and then one of them exploded and they threw confetti everywhere. <laughs> so that's uh, some of the fun from Denver. And uh, some of you might remember Steve Tibbet, who I think wrote the antivirus program. So those are his pictures. Um, what else? I had something else I wanted to say about Denver. Oh yeah, this is what I want to say about Denver. We brought our AA2 3000 to Denver and premiered the AA chipset. Uh, interestingly, so um, AGA, Advanced Graphics Architecture, is what they finally shifted under marketing name. The whole time the chip group was working on the Advanced Amiga Architecture, which was AAA, and we realized that wasn't going to come soon enough, and so they struck a project to make a smaller one, and because it was less than AAA, it was called AA. So the true story of the name is AA doesn't stand for anything other than it's less than AAA. <laughs> So right before the DEF CON, I, we were getting ham, 8 bit plane ham mode to work inside Intuition, and I figured out this crazy spiral pattern of color would have all possible ham 8 colors in a window. And so I put this together, and I'm like, that's 250,000 colors, and I put it right there in the title bar, but it's 1024 per thousand, so it's actually 262,000 something colors. So it's sort of a small detail, but for like two years after, all the articles about the Amiga in hand mode said up to 256,000 colors, and I sort of think, and maybe it's a little confused of mine, that it was my mistake in the night before that led to all those articles having the wrong hand. And when we went back to Orlando, it was corrected to 262, and if you get the, the latest uh, DEF CON discs, they changed the copyright to SCON, and it hasn't worked out. So yeah, that was the first time we showed a quarter million colors on an Amiga all the time. So that was a fun uh, Denver story. And then um, Orlando was the last developer sponsor. So that was 1993. We had a lot of fun. And uh, I don't remember if I have any Orlando pictures. But the, what was in the news right before Orlando was the Sears catalog. So Sears is kind of like Amazon, but you can only hit F5 once a year. So you get the catalog, right? And then you could uh, order from the catalog. And the big news, like the week before, was that Sears was announcing that they were giving up on their on their catalog. And so I gave my presentation on what was new at Intuition 3.0 and what have you. And then we opened it up for questions. And there was a question about something, something mouse pointer, something, something. Many of our colors, and then someone put up their hand and says, what are you guys going to do about marketing? And I'm not the marketing guy, but I, you know, I basically said, I don't know what I was thinking. I just blurted out, we're going to be listed in the Sears catalog. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone laughed. But then after I spoke, I got then on the stage, and the person came up to me in all sincerely, in sincerity said, you do know they canceled the catalog, right? <laughs> so. Uh, now I've got some interesting random tidbits. So the 1.0 Omega clock icon had the hands, and I forget what, 12, 15 position. Uh, Eric Cotton redrew the clock icon in 1.1 or 1.2. This is a tribute to the Challenger space shuttle at the time of the liftoff of Challenger, the space shuttle. And that secret I learned it three years ago, and I don't really know that it was known before then. That's an interesting, interesting piece of our history. Um, one of the things that we had to do was 2.0 compatibility. So a lot of software broke when we shipped release 2. Some of it was 
our bugs that we added. Some of it was bad assumptions that programmers made. And, and Bryce basically said, Bryce Nesbitt said, doesn't matter who's to blame. It's not about quoting chapter and verse out of the ROM kernel manuals. We're not big enough to drag our developers to fix all their software. From our customer's point of view, we broke it. We need to figure out a way to fix it. So from a period of uh, 2.0 to 2.04, we worked pretty much night and day, and there was a core group of us, Mark Hannes here, Mike is here, Darren Greenwald, Randall, myself, a couple other people, non-stop, picking apart why these things were broken, figuring out what we did wrong, or what kind of workaround we could do to bring them back. And to, I just picked one example, which was photon paint. So one day we get a report from the field, photon paint freezes the third time you access the menu. So I'm like, okay, you know, trust the report, but don't trust the details sometimes for run report. It's probably freezing about one time in three, so I fire it up. One, two, three, freeze, reboot, try it again. One, two, three, freeze. It had to do with some uh, tricky typeface they wanted to use in the pull-down menus, and they were hooking the menu verify. We had some logic to prevent fonts from being removed twice from a list that had a bug, and then sure enough, it froze on the third time you access the menus every time. And so we didn't know where to begin with any of these things. A lot of really hard forward debugging had to happen outside our domain of knowledge, doing all kinds of stuff. And 2.04 was a great release, it was because of that really super fun project. And we weren't, you know, inventing new things at that time, but we really, that was a so satisfying part of the work. And Warren Kelly, who's one of the lead programmers on Photon Paint, uh, when I went to grab this picture, I learned he went on to be a movie producer and director, and actually the Paranormal Activity series is his brainchild. And that movie is deemed to be the most profitable movie in Hollywood history from a cost to revenue point of view because it made several million dollars off $28,000 movie cost. So some people went on to do interesting things outside of computers, a really interesting story that I didn't know before last week when I pulled this together. So the Intel processors and the Motorola processors, the byte order for words was opposite. And so when we sent out the mass ROMs for 2.04, we said, make sure you get these Motorola style. We gave them an EEPROM. Make it just like this EEPROM. And they came back wrong. So we had a, a trash batch of ROMs. So Bryce uh, drilled holes in them and gave us all keychains. I think Spence has, he still carries his. So Spence is, that's mine. It's back at home. Uh, so this is the oldest story of the bunch, which is I asked Bryce, I said, I've never seen the code that powers the Amiga 1000 boot ROM which is that piece of software that asks you with the kickstart disk. That's all it is. And he's like, oh, it's on some tape somewhere. Or someday I'll show it to you. So I keep like, re-asking him. And finally, he got annoyed enough to dig it out. And so we um, found it. I'm reading through the source code. And I see there's some kind of turtle graphic system to draw this kickstart hand. And the function call, I don't even know who wrote that. Do you know who wrote that? I don't know who wrote the function Yeah, so the, the function was called good hand. That was the name of the function call that put up his hand. And I'm looking through the source code, and I see a function called bad hand. <laughs> it's not what you think. It's not what you think. So, so Bryce wrote a little program that basically he could plug this function into, and he called bad hand. So then he went back into the code, and he's like, there's a code path here. It seems to be if the chipsets aren't, something's wrong with the system. But there's a bug here, which is the coder never turned on the display DMA. So he added the whatever call to turn on the display DMA, and this came out. Does anybody remember? No one's ever seen this, because no Amiga 1000 was actually capable of producing that. But they go back to the source code of Amiga 1000, it was supposed to display that, that when it was unhappy during Buddha. Um, the famous message that would come up, Amiga born a champion, and you know, we made it, they ended it up. So that was in the ROM in 1.2 and earlier, probably in 1.3 ROM. No one seemed to really know when it disappeared, but it, we nuked it in set patch. So at some point in a Windows update, they just hooked the change window title function. And they fixed it, and, and I know Carolyn Schefter was involved, and about 10 years ago, we were uh, talking about it, and she was saying something about how they, there was a group that sat around and tried to come up with ideas for what to put in this place. <laughs> and they had a lot of good ideas that weren't used. But the one that I remember she said was, they were really tempted to put in Amiga. They made it. We funded it up. <laughs> so 1990, 1990, I got engaged to Lee's. A lot of you, if you were at DEF CON, she helped with registration. And uh, Bryce 
we're still married. Uh, Bryce took uh, the code and he put in secret messages, he changed the secret messages to be sort of attributed to us, and then he got everyone to sign the floppy, and I still have this. It still does load on the Kickstarter. I'm hoping to transfer it to a kick file today or tomorrow so I can figure out what the secret message is actually said. <laughs> <laughs> I could have fixed that in Photoshop, but I really did some idea. Yeah, Brian Jackson, Darren Greenwald, Martin Hunt, Bill Kester, who did the first analysis of the Nika virus, Andy, Simon and Randall, uh, Kevin Clove, Ray Brand, Spence, Mike Sims, Jeff Porter, signature hasn't changed at all. So I still have that disc, it's a fond memory, and, and it's a uh, December 1990 vintage, and I don't know that there's any alpha releases of that vintage floating around, so there actually could be some interesting stuff. Uh, to boot that up and have a look at it. And then, uh, let's see, I think we're right about at the point where I'm going to pass the baton for the moment. This young man. I don't know who that is. Hi, everybody. I'm Spencer Shaxton. Um, let's go the other one. Just to prove that I am as aim retentive as Peter is, I also found my offer that I'm so phenomenal. This is also from Andy Finkel. Andy gave me one of the best interviews I ever had for a job uh, application. It was uh, January, February 1990, in Paris at the Paris Dev Park. And uh, uh, I was working the previous summer during my uh, summer break for a UK company called Arbonne Software, run by Jess Sam. And I'm at the Paris Dev Park, Jess comes up to me and says hi. Said, I, want to to Andy. I want to introduce you to Andy Kingle. So I go over to Andy, and he says, Hi Spencer, uh, you've been highly recommended to us by Dear Sam, would you like a job? So I just thought, that's awesome. That's right at the end of my college years. I was just getting ready to start looking for work. I had this dream job handed to me. How can I say no? I remember watching the launch of the Amiga from NPC television news coverage in about 85. Um, that's an amazing computer. How can it possibly afford one? And thankfully, the 500 came out a few years later. I saved up my tennis, I bought one, started playing with it. A few years later, I'm flying out to Westchester and actually work on the Amiga Project itself. So it's a great opportunity. So, what did I do at Commodore? I worked on the graphics library. And fortunately, I had the foresight to document what I did, so I can talk to you about it 25 years later. Uh, I had to go back and read this to remind myself about a lot of the details. Um, I started at Commodore in August 90. It was the tail end of the 1.4, 2.0 beta cycle, and everybody was getting ready to release the 2.0 uh, Office Kickstarter. Um, uh, I was working with Bob White at the time, and he was handing parts of the graphics library over to me. I remember I had to fix a few bars, one of our clip wrecks, and I know this because I found my uh, performance in you. I fixed a bug called the draw pattern lines to clip wrecks. Something to do with those ants is that you drag the mouse around, and if you went across a different window, and the uh, ants have to be hidden behind the window, then when the window refreshed itself, there are little pixels left behind. I had to fix that bug was one of the first things I did. But I also took over a new concept in the graphics library called the, uh, uh, the graphics database. This was a database built into the system that allowed for new monitors to be added or uh, available to the system. So we had power monitors, NTSC monitors, VGA monitors, and so on. And it was a data-driven system. I took it over from Bart. Um, a few years later, about 92, maybe 93, uh, a couple of hardware engineers, Chris Coley and uh, Joe Abenbrown, had this idea to build a video frame buffer car to give the Amiga more resolution than it had natively. They were designing it out. They came to me before the project started and said, Spence, if we could build this and spend our time building this, would you write the software for us? And if so, how long would it take? Yeah, take about a long weekend, I can probably do it for you. And they said, great. So off they go, they work on this, this unofficial Stuntworks project. They're working on it in the evenings in the labs, designing this board out, putting the chips on, hand wiring the chips onto the board, very intricate process. And after about two weeks, they come to me on a Friday evening, hand me the board, 
said, okay, it's yours, go grab the software for it. They then go off to get orders off it and pack it. An hour later, I hand them a floppy and say, here, ask what? What? He says it's going to take a whole weekend. Well, I like it. So, after the 1.4, 2.0 software shipped, it was time to move on to supporting the, uh, the AGA slash double A ship that had. Um, so, Alice and Agnes and Denise. This is a picture of Alice with his head taken off. Um, so, the chip guys got back the first version of the Alice chipset and discovered that there was a bug in the silicon. They could do the low res and the high res modes, but they couldn't do the super high res mode. But they also worked out that if they laser cut one of the lines on the top of the surface, then super high res worked, but the other modes didn't. So they built me, or they zapped me this version of the chip, and I would literally be sitting there at my desk, swapping chips out from one to the other and testing out different graphics modes. So a lot of the work I was doing bringing up the AA chipset revolved around controlling the copper and the uh, copperless. This is a coprocessor. It's one of the special features that makes the Amiga the Amiga. And I was responsible for making sure that the copperless was set up correctly so that we could set up all the registers to manage the display and the colors and the sprites and so on. Um, it was kind of getting kind of tiresome having my main development machine while writing code testing the new code on the other machine. If there's any mistake in the copper list, then the display gets corrupted and you can't really see what's going on. So I built this server client software where I ran the client on my main developer machine, controlled by an AREX application, running inside Cygnus Head, my editor, to send a message over to a server running on the machine of debugging. So when the screen screwed up, I could then run this client code, see a copper list dump out of my text editor, go in there, change the value that I think was wrong, push it back out to the machine, and see the correction being made. That gave me clues about how to fix the bugs inside my software. It's a very efficient way of working. It also opened itself up to some mischief. Because now I can take this server software and install it in any of my colleagues who were not very careful about how they left their machines unguarded. <laughs> and David Juno had the misfortune of sitting next to me and they were in the other cubicle. Hi, David. <laughs> David was working on his um, I mean, app store or app, uh, uh, some object oriented application viewer. And I remember waiting for him to give a whoop to light as he got some really intricate, complicated code working. And then I go, uh huh, bang, change your bytes per row, and this thing would go all crazy. So as we're building out this new software to pull the AA chipset, we got one eye on AAA. And we knew that the new registers in AA would not be compatible with the AAA chipset. Uh, so we were very much advocating, you know, don't hit the hardware, please use the operating system. But there was no clean way to control the copper list inside the OS and use the new features in the AA chipset to do things like graded screens and some of the other tricks that we were, that we were doing. So towards the end of my time at Commodore, I put together a new library called the Special Effects Library. I'm not sure it actually shipped in any official version of Kickstarter or Workbench, but we did incorporate it into the CD32 project. And I remember pulling an all-nighter with uh, Martin, who was working on the CD32, uh, to try and use this special effects library to do the smooth blue gradient that you see on the CD32 uh, setup screen. That was all using the special effects library, all-nighter, and now back to CD32 with Peter. CD32 stuff, so there's the CD32 remote. Can you hear me? Uh, my mic? Yeah. Good. Okay, so um, just a short story. The reason the green is pale green there is because um, it occurred to me from traffic lights that we want to make sure the red and the green are visible to colorblind people. The message there is we can really like act far outside our formal domain and contribute to things like color design of a button even though you're a software guy and that's really was sort of the spirit I think that RJ was talking about and Dave was talking about that there were titles and silos and it was everyone rolling to a common goal. Um, but the CD32 language screen, and this is my last tale, um, has maps, uh, uh, a globe space
spinning, and it has flags of all the different countries. And a language selector, if you scroll up and down, selected language flag would wave. And the, um, this came to me somehow or other, and all the languages that were selectable are out here. And oddly enough, the artist had put the Canadian flag out in the open, and lots of other flags that are sort of partly hidden. The Canada flag was, was there, but it was really badly drawn. And I noticed that, because for some reason, and um, so I repainted that. It's a lot harder to draw one than it looks. And then I went and sort of tackled a bunch of the other flags, like the Union Jack, that also were, were troublesome. And so cleaned that out, and the tree looks really nice. And that's actually where we put the secret messages. And I spent three days, two weeks ago, trying to figure out how to get the secret messages to come up. But it's a pattern you tap out on the remote control. And Martin did the, the work for the secret message. And so when you um, actually go through a CD, 32 boot sequence, here it is. It's kind of interesting, so Martin is also from Montreal. I said, well, what would really appropriate is after you selected the secret message, then anytime later, if you pick either English or French, let's make the Canadian flag wave instead. <laughs> and so that's what we did. And that's a very not well known Easter egg inside an Easter egg on the CD32. <laughs> So that basically brings me to the, to the end. Um, I want to thank uh, all these folks that helped me pull out the pictures and retrieve software, uh, John Schilling, Randall, Jeff, Bill Kester, T.J. with and Mike Sims, and all the dreamers, not just that worked at Amiga and at Commodore, but in the whole ecosystem, created the software and the hardware for the Amiga. And I really think that probably we did put a ding in the universe, there's a small chance it was just a populist trick. <laughs> And the last thing is, last, last, is that there was a, um, when RJ passed the torch of intuition to Jim, RJ gave Jim the t-shirt that he had from Amiga Days. And when Jim uh, passed the torch on to me, he gave me the t-shirt. And when I left, and David Junot took over, I broke the chain. So, um, so I'm really sorry, David. I did bring the shirt. <laughs> but I think it belongs back with our opinion. Oh